And our, our last speaker is uh, Pat Glibert from that great institution, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Okay, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Debbie, for the invitation to be here. This has been a great meeting. This has been a great session. I'm batting cleanup here, um, <laughs> continuing to hammer home the idea that ratios matter. And I'm going to add a new dimension to our conversation and uh, talk about some of the impacts of our changing nutrients due to anthropogenic uh, footprints. So I'm going to ask two main questions. The first is, do changes in N2P loads from anthropogenic activities have consequences for the food web? We know they have consequences when systems are nutrient limited, but what happens when systems are not nutrient limited, uh, when they're normally taken to be sufficient for growth, eutrophic systems? And how are changes in microbial entropy affecting carbon cycling? So in my talk, I'm going to have four basic sections. The first is global trends. What are we doing to our nitrogen and phosphorus ratios? I'm going to then take a couple of uh, regional examples and look at how food webs have been changing over time in conjunction with changing N to P. I'm then going to drill down and show some experiments and some physiological data that uh, helps us to understand these changes. Then I'll close the loop and come back and return to the big picture and answer questions such as how do we look at all of these changes in other contexts as well, such as climate change. There's no question we have a huge global nitrogen footprint. And this global nitrogen footprint is a consequence of our increasing population, our demands for few food and fuel, our agricultural use of nitrogen, for example, nitrogen fertilizers, which continue to grow, go up on a global basis. We're increasing phosphorus as well, but not nearly at the rate of change in nitrogen. And as a consequence, our global N2P loads have increased at least threefold over the past several decades. Well, of course, these changes are not uh, uniform around the world. Um, we know we have lots of nitrogen hotspots, lots of phosphorus hotspots. And while they're mostly the same, they're not exactly the same. And of course, this is not your coastal oceanographer's pro problem anymore. It is an oceanographic problem because with this wonderful paper that just came out from Sharples, it estimates the proportion of nitrogen and phosphorus from coastal systems exported to the open ocean. And where you see the ribbon running uh, orange or red, there is a high proportion of export to the open ocean. So let's take a look at some regional examples. Here's the Rhine and the Meuse, rivers that export into the North Sea. This is the kind of change in export that we see. Uh, Meuse here, um, it's an eight-fold difference in N to P export over the past um, several decades. We see the same thing in estuaries around the world. We see it in the San Francisco Bay Delta. Here, um, a multifold increase in N to P. San Francisco Bay Delta is a little bit different. It's not driven entirely by agricultural nutrients. It's an urban issue as well. There's a reason the San Francisco Bay Delta is called the toilet bowl estuary. It has enormous export into the estuary of ammonium from <clears throat> sewage discharge. So what is this What's the relationship with food webs? Well, if we look at the Rhine River example, the blue line here is the cumulative number of invasive species. And the orange points are the N to P. <coughs> Looks like they're walking in lockstep. Is there a cause and effect? Well, we'll 
maybe try to tease that apart, but at least there are changing food webs. There are changing food webs in San Francisco as well. We have a long record of invasive species, and at least with the record of NDP that we have, again, the uh, cumulative number of invasive species seems to track this change in N to P. So let's look a little bit more closely at San Francisco. Here are some of the species that have increased over time. We have dinoflagellates increasing. We have many more flagellates as well in addition to dinoflagellates increasing. We have an increase in this microzooplankton limnothoina, an increase in invasive clams, an increase in largemouth bass, sunfish. Uh, these have been coming in large predators. There has been a loss of diatoms and an overall loss of chlorophyll, a loss of uretemra and neomysis. So all of these invasive species have come in, but there have been uh, declines in these species in relation to N to P. I've shown it here as ammonium to phosphate. These are not the only species that are changing, but just to give you a sampling of the species that are changing. Let's look a little bit more closely at Uritemra. If we look over time at the 30-year record, where there was a lot of Uritemra, we had a lot of diatoms. When diatoms dropped out of the system, we had fewer Uritemra. So we know that there's a food quantity problem. What about food quality? Is food quality changing in this system um, and affecting the physiology of the organisms and therefore their potential success. So let's look a little closer at this change in uretemra and limnothoina. Over time, uretemra has declined substantially and now the dominant uh, microzooplankton is limnothoina. In between these years, there was a series of Copepods that came and went didn't last very long, but it's basically been a wholesale shift from a uretemra system to a limnothoina system. If we look at the ratio of those two organisms, the ratio of the copepod abundance, it's a mirror image of the ratio of N to P, and they correlate very well. So this begs physiological experiments, of course. So we did a series of physiological experiments, somewhat similar to the experiments that Bob talked about earlier. We asked how the nitrogen to phosphorus of food might change the composition of uretemra, how it might change excretion, egg content, egg production, and egg viability. Now, we were interested in understanding this from the perspective not of nutrient-limited food, but nutrient-saturated food, yet changing those ratios. So we grew uh, the diatom thalassiosara in continuous culture. These were grown in turbidistat culture, not chemostat, so we kept them at um, high growth rate, nutrient-saturated, um, but we could alter the ratios in the media. So we did achieve diatoms with a different N to P ratio as a function of uh, varying N to P in the media. And that uh, translated also to different C to P ratios. So we then fed these diatoms to the copepods, keeping carbon the same. So this was not a food quantity issue. This was just a food quality issue, looking only at these slight differences in N to P. And we did um, achieve differences in N and P and C content of the copepod. So on a relative basis, as the N to P changed in the diatom, when the phosphate content was a little bit high, was higher, um, again, keeping carbon con constant. 
the copepods became somewhat more nitrogen rich. They retained nitrogen, perhaps disproportionately, relative to the other food. And the same with phosphorus. When phosphorus was relatively poor in the food, they retained more phosphorus, um, perhaps disproportionately. So there was an N to P change in the copepods. They did not maintain exact N to P across all of this food. Now I'm going to skip over the excretion. You've heard a lot about the effects of different food on excretion. And I'm going to look now at the results from the egg hatching and egg viability. And here we did find that giving them plenty of food but varying the N to P content, the percent of eggs that were viable hatching success uh, decreased as the phosphorus content of the food decreased. So this is at least in directionality consistent with a stress of this species as N to P increased in this eutrophic system. So there are many consequences to eating here or here, if you're a zooplankton. The consequences are effects on biomass composition, nutrient regeneration, egg composition, viability. And this occurs even when there's no food limitation or nutrient limitation. These were, again, nutrient sufficient uh, phytoplankton just with variable N to P. So as we push systems with <coughs> new nitrogen, we can change the physiology of higher trophic levels. And we know that phytoplankton, even though they tend to cluster around red field ratios, there are different optimal N to P ratios for different phytoplankton. And so we can push systems into um, a new normal, new type of phytoplankton when we push systems into higher and higher N to P conditions. So let's look at the system now from the phytoplankton perspective. As I said, we had a loss of diatoms, a decline in diatoms. There was an increase in dinoflagellates, but an increase overall in lots of other types of flagellates as well. It became a flagellated dominated system. So we've pushed the system to higher into P. What are some of the adaptive strategies of phytoplankton to live in a higher N to P environment? Well, you either upregulate or you downregulate. And if you downregulate, one strategy may be that cells might be able to substitute P rich lipids with non phospholipids. So they have a lower phosphorus requirement overall. Lots of cyanobacteria can do this. Another strategy might be to access alternate substrates, so top up that missing uh, phosphorus by seeking uh, organic substrates or particulate substrates. So mixotrophs become um, more prevalent. And cells can also have um, mechanisms to dissipate the excess nutrients. We know phytoplankton put out lots of DOC, they put out lots of DON. Some of these compounds are actually some of the toxins that we're worried about. So mixotrophs do especially well at higher and higher N to P. Mixotrophy matters. Mixotrophy is the combination of phototrophy and heterotrophy in the same organism. And it's not a matter of the organism being a little plant at some points and a little animal at other points, but rather it's doing these um, both at the same time synergistically. It's not just a curiosity. We're finding more and more mixotrophs in more and more uh, situations. They thrive under conditions of nutrient imbalance. And we are driving systems into conditions of nutrient imbalance. And they gain a growth advantage from grazing. As a phototroph, they're taking up nutrients. 
photosynthesizing and growing. But if they are doing that and simultaneously eating, they may be eating for, uh, they may be trying to access that um, top up of phosphorus, but in the, in the same time, they acquire all that extra carbon. And so they get that carbon boost and therefore a growth boost. So we know mixotrophs uh, that grow phototrophically grow much more slowly than they do when they're growing as a mixotroph. Cochlidinium is, a, is an example where it doubles its growth rate when we add more food. So that's a food quantity issue. But do mixotrophs respond to nutrient quality? Do they look for different, or do they grow differently when the food quality changes? So um, how do they respond to prey of different quality? But yet they're also phototrophs, so they too are highly variable in their nutritional quality. And does any of this have any impacts on the um, tendency for these mixotrophs to become toxic? Now, many HABs or harmful algae um, are mixotrophs. The non-cyanobacteria, non-diatom HABs are mostly mixotrophs, but not all mixotrophs are HABs. So we've done a series of experiments where we've grown predator and prey at uh, varying nutri nutrient status. Here's an example with Primnesium parvum. We grew it at three growth NTP conditions and the prey in three growth NTP conditions. And we did all the different crosses and looked at growth rates. We did the same experiment with Carlodinium, um, somewhat different NTP ratios, but um, the idea is the same. How is the predator responding to prey of different nutrient quality? And just to give you a little snippet of these results, um, here, this is the Primnesium parvum data. If we hold the prey NTP constant, and look at the mixotroph in variable nutritional states, we see that it changes its growth rate significantly. And it, the highest growth rate comes when the mixotroph was relatively phosphorus poor, grazing on a phosphorus rich prey item. Makes perfect sense, but we have to show that kind of thing. And here, um, the food food quantity across all of these experiments was held constant. We see the same thing with carlidinium. And we see the same thing if we hold the mixotroph N to P constant and vary the nutritional quality of the prey. We get a growth boost, a substantial growth boost. So, and again, the same thing with Carlidinium. So it's entirely possible that these dinoflagellates or mixotrophs um, in a natural environment can naturally intercept a prey of a different nutritional quality. For example, in an estuary, prey coming out of a tributary with a different nutrient load, and a very rapid growth rate can <clears throat> occur. For those mixotrophs that are toxic and for those that uh, put their toxin out into the water, they don't all do that. But that can be a pretty synergistic strategy because if you can stun your prey and then you can grab it um, somewhat more efficiently, you get that extra growth boost. And we know that many HABs become more toxic when they're in nutritionally imbalanced conditions. So this is um, Alexandrium, the most common HAB out here. 
and more PSP is produced at high NTP conditions. It's a carbon-rich molecule. It also has nitrogen. We see the same with microcystis. Primnesium parvum is somewhat interesting because it's toxic at both ends of the NTP spectrum, not really in the middle. So uh, the, the carbon that is being put out in these molecules and in the case of high NTP conditions, the nitrogen may be part of the physiological overflow mechanisms that um, are part of living in excess. So now I'd like to talk about some in silico experiments. And this is work done in collaboration with Kevin Flynn and Aditi Mitra and a working group of mixotrophs, <laughs> mixotroph um, <laughs> investigators. Uh, we've been interested in what effect mixotrophs have on um, ecosystems and they've been advancing the modeling aspect of this. So if we take a traditional NPZ model and now add a mixotroph box and separate out the microzole plankton from the macrozole plankton and look over time, in a traditional model, we get lots of phytoplankton and some zooplankton. There are no mixotrophs in that model. <laughs> and here, uh, when we add mixotrophs, we find that the mixotrophs actually start to dominate. There is a substantial fraction of the community. Extending that modeling effort a little further and asking the question, how does that model change when we look under low red field or high NTP conditions? This is what the food web would look like. These boxes are bacteria, microzole plankton, phytoplankton um, in the traditional um, way. And here's the mixotroph modeling. And you can see in all conditions, mixotrophs are very important. But most interestingly is that under a mixotroph world, in model world, <laughs> food webs um, predict that we have higher C carbon fixation. And that's true here under low end of P, red field, and high end of P. It's especially true um, under these conditions. It's that topping up factor that we talked about before. Also, um, a mixotroph world predicts that we have higher DOC flux, but that net DOC flux is only going to be positive under high end of P conditions. So the red bars are actually higher here in the model, mixotroph model than the non-mixotroph model, but we get net DOC flux in the high DOC in the high end of P condition. And um, I want to highlight this paper by Ben Ward and uh, Mick Follows, where they incorporated mixotrophs into the global modeling. And so here's the traditional model. Here's their mixotrophy model. And for um, if you look under the world where it's mostly N-limited, P-limited, or iron-limited, we start to see more white streaks here. And those white streaks represent um, the role of mixotrophy. In other words, mixotrophs in the mixotroph uh, modeling configuration are now doing most of the acquisition of the uh, limited nutrient. And they also predict production of larger cells and more export because those larger cells are larger and sinking faster. So as we add a larger fraction of mixotrophy to global carbon, we get larger cells and more export. So returning to our global nitrogen footprint, we know that we have 
more harmful algae occurring in more places, more times, more often, often more toxic. And many of these HABs are occurring in places where that nitrogen is being exported from anthropogenic sources. And we can partition those anthropogenic sources due to um, uh, fertilizer or manure or biological fixation. We know, um, here's an example of per centrum minimum, a mixotroph that tracks global nitrogen eutrophication. <coughs> so we were interested in applying global models. Um, here the URSA model in conjunction with um, Icarus Allen and colleagues at Plymouth to assess if we take a nutrient ratio approach and ask, are we going to see more harmful algae in the future as uh, the ocean warms? And I'm going to skip over all the details and just show you, at least in some parts of the global ocean, it certainly appears that our projection is for more mixotrophs, and in this case, uh, more um, habitat for this harmful algal uh, dinoflagellate per centrum. This, um, we see this global expansion through this whole region, projected out to 2100. So it's the interplay between nutrient stoichiometry ecosystem maturity, and the success of mixotrophy that helps to explain why eutrophication is often associated with mixotrophic HABs. And we project that mixotrophy is going to be a dominant uh, mechanism um, as we go forward. So um, I hope I've shown you that nitrogen is increasing globally faster than phosphorus, leading to uh, high proportions that are exported beyond the coastal zone. Um, estuaries around the world are seeing these ratios increase, and we're seeing changing food webs accordingly. We have a lot of physiological data that tells us that, yes, there are underlying physiological responses to changing nutrients in eutrophic systems and in limited systems. And this is contributing to the increasing success of mixotrophy and harmful algae. So imbalances in nitrogen to phosphorus, even in non-limiting conditions, our eutrophic conditions have implications for mixotrophy and for growth rates, abundance and toxicity of HABs, changes in nutrient loads, alter the stoichiometry and food quality for all grazers. And a mixotroph-centric world alters carbon fixation, carbon export, trophodynamics, and biogeochemistry. And I want to thank a lot of people who've contributed to the work I've presented and various sources of support for both uh, direct experiments and, and data collection, as well as for various working groups that um, have come together for the ideas that I've presented here. Thank you. So a couple questions for Pat before we get our whole group together. <laughs> Bethany. <laughs> Pat, that's an amazing talk and, and such a nice synthesis of data. Um, I had a question about the contribution of atmospheric nitrogen deposition mm -hmm. in this picture. And so your yep. um, compelling story of this emergence of mixotrophy, I would think, would just be even more exacerbated by global atmospheric deposition. Absolutely. Um, there, I only was able to show the um, fertilizer change. Atmospheric change is another one. Uh, the other change that is um, substantial in parts of the world is the growth of aquaculture, intensive aquaculture, because there's an awful lot of uh, recycling of materials, especially um, where that aquaculture is truly intensive. So yes, we've been putting a lot of this um, 
together in global models. But atmosphere, for sure. <laughs> I've been working in a system uh, that probably has changed the most rapidly in the past 10 years than any other ecosystem. And we see exactly the changes that you talk about, the emergence of mixotrophs, which have replaced diatoms. Um, up until the 80s and early 90s, it was diatom dominated, and it occupied about 60% of the total biomass. But today we see a change, a switchover to Noctiluca, and it occupies about um, almost about 100% in some places. Um, and again, one of the biggest sources of uh, this nutrient imbalance that you've spoken about is fertilizer usage in this area. India, uh, when it emerged on this green revolution, started using huge amounts of fertilizers which are having their impacts now. <clears throat> but we do see this spreading southwards. It has started appearing off the the coast of East Africa and has migrated even further south to Seychelles and uh, even parts of the Maldives. It's seen in uh, Southeast Asia as well. So it's exactly what you said. We are moving to an ecosystem that is going to be dominated by mixotrophs. And the Arabian Sea is a shining example of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm so aware of your system <laughs> and the Noctiluca blooms that have taken over the Arabian Sea area. and. Um, it's an example as well where the nutrient pollution effects are not just a ribbon along the coast, but are rather being exported um, far. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, a lot of that nutrient being exported um, off the coast of India is in the form of ammonium. And those concentrations are actually so high that not all of it is being taken up right, right along the coast. And so um, it's only when it gets exported that we start to see the succession of species. And ultimately, the mixotrophs win. <laughs> Barney? Hey, Barney. <laughs> Hi, great talk. You talked about mixotrophy mostly in terms of phagotrophy. How about osmotrophy? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I could only cover so much here. <laughs> Is much known about changes in osmotrophy associated with change in nitrogen? We know that osmotrophy is um, common among virtually all phytoplankton. All phytoplankton are taking up um, various forms of organic nitrogen and organic car um, organic phosphorus. Um, there is, we know that organic nor sources of nutrient are contributing more than we ever thought. Uh, I think um, I emphasize the phagotrophy here because that's kind of the, the part of the um, nutrition that um, we haven't recognized nearly as much. And really now seeing the role, the linkage between this new type of nutrition. It's not just being autotrophic and heterotrophic one or the other, but doing both together is having major impacts on carbon cycling, as well as nitrogen cycling and phosphorus cycling. 